Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, this re webinar is being recorded on Tuesday, September 22, 2015. All lines have been muted to cut down on background noise. You may ask a question at any time using the chat link on the left side of your screen. I would now like to turn the floor over to Martha Kiralidu of the Association of Research Libraries. Martha, please go ahead. Thank you, Amy. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we are really delighted to have all of you here interested to learn about the latest pilot experience, uh, uh, experiment sort of, that we did uh, on uh, the uh, well-known Live Call survey. Uh, as Amy said, everyone is muted to cut down on background noise, so please type your questions in the chat box on the left-hand corner. And a recording of the webcast will be posted on ARL's YouTube channel after the event. And I'd like to welcome uh, in this uh, webcast uh, uh, beyond myself uh, our two presenters, Rachel Llewellyn from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and Sarah Murphy from Ohio State University. Uh, they will be the main presenters for today's uh, webcast. We also want to remind people that we have uh, three more webcasts we have captured uh, uh, with colleagues uh, from other institutions implementing and speaking on different aspects of uh, improving library services. Um, and uh, we've had colleagues from McGill and Texas A&M and, &M and uh, from the UK, uh, from Cranfield University and there. Uh, webcasts are available on the ARL YouTube channel. We do promote this uh, series of webcasts uh, as one of uh, our offerings that promote uh, one of our new um, strategic directions, um, a strategic direction known as Libraries That Learn. And uh, this uh, webcast series is known as the Libraries That Learn webcast series. Uh, since it features ways for libraries to learn and use the evidence they have been uh, collecting. So I do um, uh, want to say a few things about uh, uh, what inspired the, um, the pilot we are going to talk about. Uh, from time to time we have heard our live call uh, participating libraries um, bemoan a little bit uh, the fact that they have to send reminders to everybody uh, without um, knowing who has responded uh, and um, who has not. Uh, so historically, the LibQual survey protocol uh, was developed uh, and uh, has been promoted as being anonymous. Uh, so as a result, people were um, burdened with unwanted reminders. And uh, there was no way to really know if someone had filled in uh, the survey more than once, for example. And uh, uh, you know, these were two motivating factors that uh, let us consider the development of uh, the confidential uh, survey approach to doing live call. And we're really grateful to both Rachel Wellen and Sarah Murphy for um, stepping on the plate and being willing to test it. So uh, what have we done with the confidential protocol that sort of um, uh, it makes it interesting and, and useful to libraries? Um, the key feature is that you are able to send reminders only to those people who either have not viewed the survey or have not submitted the survey. And as a result, you minimize uh, the burden of sending subsequent reminders for filling in the survey, targeting only those who have not responded. And um, you are also able to calculate more accurately uh, response rates because uh, there are controls uh, uh, behind the scenes that tell you, um, you know, who has responded, and a person can only respond once. 
uh, so they do, cannot go uh, to a generic URL and respond multiple times uh, because every URL is unique and is tied to uh, the email address of a respondent. So th this also, I think, uh, brings forward a number of issues uh, that uh, we will have to sort of discuss as a community and as a profession. You know, with the anonymous protocol, we do not link perceptions and behaviors with any other data. That ability is not there. With a confidential protocol, though, the ability to link perceptions and the responses to, you know, uh, the behavioral um, questions, the, the survey includes, um, you can link that information to uh, potentially uh, other data, uh, and eventually uh, one could even go to, to as far as uh, doing real outcomes assessment uh, by, by linking these perceptions and expectations of library service quality to um, other outcomes that the users are achieving. Um, um, you know, graduation uh, completion time, uh, graduation rates, future plans. Uh, uh, but all of that, I think, will, will have to be discussed and vetted and um, understood uh, a lot more thoroughly as we move forward. Um, so the last bullet points I have there is about the importance of ethical considerations, uh, both on the anonymous survey protocol and on the confidential survey protocol. You know, even with the anonymous survey protocol, oftentimes people come back to us and they uh, say, well, you know, the computer IP could be unique. You know, this way you can identify a unique computer tied to a unique user. Well, the, 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 theoretically, yes, but we do not release um, IP um, addresses uh, to the participating institutions. And, uh, you know, another um, consideration, ethical consideration, is about the incentive prize winners, uh, win winner um, emails. And, uh, you know, libraries come and um, ask us, you know, can you uh, really tell from that information uh, who has responded? We have set up actually the anonymous survey protocol in such a way that the survey responses are disassociated from the um, table where we capture the um, uh, emails for the incentive prize winners. So we have uh, taken steps in building the anonymous protocol that um, address the ethical considerations um, of maintaining anonymity. On the confidential side, there are also uh, similarly you know, ethical considerations. Uh, that um, uh, one needs to consider. A, a, a key consideration is, you know, is this programmatic assessment or are you doing uh, this uh, more as a research project? There are different uh, regulatory and um, uh, each institution actually varies in the way, a little bit in the way they approach programmatic assessment. So you will have to talk with the institutional researchers in your institution to get a better sense of um, how your institution are approach, is approaching some of these ethical um, guidelines. Um, and um, of course, uh, uh, what we end up having um, now that uh, we, we, on the confidential uh, protocol, now that we know who's responding and all that, uh, we also capture their emails on the um, uh, email, um, we, you know, incentive um, prize winner database. Sometimes these two lists of emails uh, do not match because uh, on the incentive winner email database, for example, we eliminate uh, uh, those that have, uh, um, you know, in included um, uh, the same email more than once, um, and. Um, uh, there are um, there's a cleaning process um, and a vetting process, uh, so th the two lists can be different. So I, you know, as you are getting uh, more uh, sophisticated in implementing uh, 
whether it's live call or other surveys, and you are considering whether you do it in an anonymous fashion or a confidential fashion, uh, know that all those ethical considerations have to be um, thought through, taken into account. Um, ultimately, um, you know, we have a responsibility to do the best we can to respect and protect uh, the subject's opinions and their um, identity. And I would recommend actually that you consider as uh, professionals engaged in uh, library assessment, uh, you consider doing on a regular basis um, a certification um, course uh, that's known as the city training. Uh, certification that's available in uh, uh, most academic institutions, and um, there is also, you know, a, a time limit for the certification. It's good for, you know, three to uh, two so years. So every three years you go uh, through that ag again, uh, because um, as our environment changes, uh, some of our understanding of how we need to approach some of these. Um, research protocols and ethics uh, also uh, shifts over time. So this was a little bit of an introduction on some aspects of doing anonymous and confidential surveys. And without uh, any further detail, I'd like to welcome Rachel Llewellyn, who's going to tell us uh, in more detail how the Live Call Confidential Pilot was implemented at the University of Massachusetts Amherst Libraries. Rachel. Thanks, Martha. Hi, everybody. So I'm happy to share some of our experiences with the Confidential Pilot. Um, I can tell you we first did Live Call in 2004, and we've done it in 2007, 2011, and this past spring in 2015. So. Um, we were especially interested in being able to customize um, and personalize messages to our users and to target the follow-up reminder messages only to people who had not yet responded. So that was what we were most interested in uh, getting started. So just to give you a little bit of background of uh, how, we, how we set things up, it, we drew, um, we did a combination of a population and a sample. We sampled our undergraduates and we pulled just over 3,000 names. We surveyed all library staff, all faculty, and all graduate students. So we did a population um, survey of those groups. A few little pieces around that, we were pulling them from our integrated library system, rather, which we get that data from our campus system. So faculty, we were able to limit that to active faculty. So we felt like we had a pretty good um, population of the faculty who were actively on campus. And you can see that that was where we had a very high response rate. We have a lot of people in the library catalog under the user group of graduate student, because they tend to be graduate students for a long time, or sometimes their status changes. So that number of 6,682 is a little bit higher than what the campus numbers represent for actively enrolled students. We saw our response rate in that group lower than it had been in previous years, but in previous years we had pulled that sample differently. So we weren't too worried about it because of sort of where we were in terms of the number of responses. So that gives you a little bit of background about how we got our sample and how we got started. Oops. So what we did is we wanted to send the mail from our Director of Libraries mailbox. So it would come directly from Jay Schaefer, Director of Libraries and not with a heading that said campus, all campus mailing or bulk mail, which is a, a good giveaway to know when you're getting a message on one of the lists. So we use Mozilla Thunderbird, and we use their mail merge add-on, a um, little tool that you install. We made sure to schedule these mailings with the campus postmaster so it didn't appear that there was some kind of bad actor activity or any kind of spamming or any kind of uh, other thing that was inappropriate happening on campus. So they would know that we were going to be producing this volume of mail. And the unique 
survey URLs were provided to us by ARL after we provided the list of emails to them. And ultimately, we sent an invitation and two reminders. This is just a little sample of what the spreadsheet looks like. Um, we blocked out the names, but we had we pulled the information from our ILS, and we had a, then we separated a first name, a last name. We had an email. Um, we had a user group designation for undergraduate, graduate library staff, uh, and faculty. The URL was given to us by ARL, as well as the information about the submit date and the start date, and whether it is valid and complete. And as we would sort through the different iterations, we could make a choice to say whether or not somebody submitted something, whether or not it was true. So if you look down, oh, maybe the third, it might be a little hard to read online. Um, there was a submit date of March 2nd, 2015, but it was not valid. So we had a choice to say, do we want to, we chose not to send reminders to people based on the status of being valid or invalid, we sent it if they said if they submitted any survey, we didn't send them a reminder. So we had that sort of different level of information to make a choice around. We also added some additional fields. Um, so to the far right is a coupon code. So we handled our incentives a little bit differently in that we offered everybody in the invitation as well as in each reminder, the opportunity to have a free beverage at our cafe by printing the message and redeeming it, whether or not they took the survey. But we were tracking redemption according to user group and whether it was on the invitation or a reminder. So we have a different coupon code for each user group and with each mailing. Similarly, there are some other columns, if you keep going, that customize the message further. There might be a custom line that says something about undergraduates or about faculty. But this gives you just a sense of the kind of, it's a standard spreadsheet. It had the URLs. It was matched up to the email. And it had our custom information as well. This is a little bit about how we got it started. So we used the double curly brackets, which was the Thunderbird protocol for doing that and it would reference the fields in the spreadsheet. So when the message was complete, you can select Mail Merge, because you can merge and send it in two steps. So it connects to the, the spreadsheet. And you can have the option to send it later, and they're compiled and stored in your mailbox. Or you can choose to send them right away after, as soon as it compiles them. So those are the steps kind of briefly that you go through. And you can see where the curly brackets are referencing your custom fields. And here's another version of that. So here the first name. Let me see if I can do this. So this first name is pulling out of here. And this is survey URL is coming from this column. And the constituent saying we, how we should make improvements for undergraduate students or for users, depending on what kind of message we wanted to send. And this could be long. It could be a couple of sentences. It didn't have to, we could put whatever we wanted into that, that spot. And then here I mentioned earlier with the coupon code where we were pulling from here. So this is to give you a little bit of a sense of, of how it worked. We didn't know how long it would take or what it would be like when we were in the process of doing that. So we started on a Friday afternoon, and we merged the messages. And we did a number of practice runs to make sure the formatting worked and that the links were active and that things were appearing the way that we hoped that they would appear for users. It took us about two hours to merge 11,000 email messages. That was great. Um, we merged them, we put them together, we held them in the mailbox, and then Monday morning, bright and early, 5.45, we um, did the send. And it went very quickly. It only took an hour and 40 minutes. Monday morning is apparently a really good time to send mail on campus. And we didn't really have any trouble. We did see a bit of variation. We did reminder the following Monday, but we didn't get started until a little bit later in the morning. So even though we were sending fewer messages, it took a lot longer to both merge and then to mail. And we did those back to back. 
And for the third and final message, we did it again on a Friday-Monday split. That Friday, though, it was a morning rather than Friday afternoon, and that took a long time. Now, it's definitely not an exact science around the merging. The one thing that we learned is you have to kind of pay attention, and I'll show you here. If you're in the process of mailing and you get an alert message, it will hold up the mailing if you're not attending to it to click OK. So we, were, we did stay close by. We didn't leave it for long periods of time, but that was certainly a factor in how long it took um, because that might not have actually um, – it could have gone a little bit more quickly if we were being more attentive to any error messages that came up. That said, we really didn't get very many error messages at all, so that was really nice. We get a regular update from our campus in terms of the email addresses, so they're very um, recently updated, and that's a pretty good source. So we don't have a lot of error messages. So that was actually really helpful to, to be sure that we were sending messages to real users. The one thing that we did learn is that on, when we merged the messages on a Friday, even though we sent them on a Monday, the timestamp on those messages was from Friday. So if that changes the order in which the mail appears in the recipient's box, that's something to think about. Um, it could be good or bad, depending on your intention, but we didn't realize that until we actually received our own Monday, me Monday morning messages with the timestamp of Friday. So that was something that we tried to pay attention to as well. So I don't know, Martha, if you wanted to take questions um, anytime here or just wait until the end, but that was a really quick introduction to how we managed the survey here. Let me unmute here. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, let's take questions at the end, and I'd like to encourage again people to put their questions in the chat box, um, and then we're going to read them. So uh, please do use the chat box on the left-hand corner of your computer screen to add your questions. Uh, thank you, Rachel, and uh, let's uh, uh, move on and hear from Sarah Murphy at uh, Ohio State. Great. Thank you, Martha. Uh, here at Ohio State, we've been administering LiveQual since 2002. We've done the survey nine times. And in the early years, our main reason for uh, our interest in doing LiveQual was um, in part to support the renovation of this building here, the Thompson Library. And as time has gone by since we finished that project, our, our, now our interest in LiveQual is more to serve as one of the benchmarks on our scorecard for our library strategic plan. So for instance, on this slide here, it shows that we're looking at the library's place dimension, and really we're just trying to maintain or improve our score by bringing this um, gap number closer to zero. Um, and so we have something here for on a teaching and learning scorecard for library's place and, and um, the affective service dimension. And then in our research and innovation scorecard, we're looking at information control. So our process for administering LiveQual Confidential here at OSU was very similar to uh, Rachel's process at UMass Amherst. Um, we did do mail merges. However, we used Outlook. Um, and ARL sent us a spreadsheet that had unique URLs. We sent ARL a spreadsheet with all of the names for faculty, undergraduate students, graduate students, and our library staff. Um, so we took the um, unique URLs that we received back and we plugged in to an Outlook mail merge. And this was um, the message that we sent. And um, you know, in the middle under Take Survey Now, we had the URL here, and it's uh, one little quirk that we found out from through this experience is that if you do a merge with the URL um, and the recipient opens the message via an Outlook client on their desktop, the URL link stays live. However, if the recipient opened the message through a webmail application, um, that link sometimes was live and sometimes was not. And we spoke with our IT department and we really never found an answer why. So if we do this again, we will um, change our language a bit to say 
um, click here now or copy and paste this URL into your web browser because uh, that was that upset some of our um, respondents. So this graph here shows uh, our respondents in relation to um, the total population. And by doing live calls confidential and just sending out reminder emails to individuals who had not taken the survey, our response rate was not affected. It did not go up or down. It was about the same as it is. Um, whenever we have administered the survey in the past, we had a 16% response rate and we distributed a total of 11,981 surveys. Now this slide here shows um, one report that we were able to make um, with our raw, raw data from our results. And um, in the past, because of the way we administered LiveQual and, and not having any um, identifying information, we weren't able to um, parse out our data that in a way that was, um, I, I don't know, I guess how to describe this. We could parse out our data, but we were restricted to OSU colleges and schools, which for a campus um, like OSU, which has many um, diverse populations and departments and unique departments such as veterinary medicine or landscape architecture and pharmacy. Um, and our librarians are assigned to multiple departments and, and their departments are not always in the same college or school. That would make, this makes parsing out our results at times difficult. And so with LiveQual Confidential, this next slide shows, um, we were able to take the unique IDs and match them back up to some local data sources so that we could obtain um, codes that were um, codes for majors and codes for faculty departments, and then use those codes to match them back up to a reference database data sheet that we have here in the libraries. It's just an Excel spreadsheet that maps um, these codes to the assigned librarian. And so now, um, our, if we have a librarian who is assigned to veterinary medicine and environmental sciences and psychology, um, that individual could re view the results for the LabQual survey all by um, her um, user group population and the results for that population only. Um, so, so we're using Tableau to run this, and, um, and it works pretty well. And um, that's uh, basically my, I think, all of my comments. Yes. And we are at the question slide again. Um, I, it's um, have you had? Uh, it's really interesting that you can now actually uh, tell you know the different subject liaison librarians that uh, you know here's the data from your own uh, subset of, of users. Um, have you had um, any direct feedback from those? Um, uh, liaison librarians about uh, the ability to mine the data this way? Um, well, let me go back a slide uh, or two. Um, you know, I, one thing I, I do want to mention too is that uh, this is set up so that if the N is less than 10, no results will show. And that's one way that, that we're um, respecting confidentiality of the individuals who um, took the survey, but also um, we're, since we're delivering these results using Tableau and Tableau Reader, the um, data, the underlying, ad any identifying data is not part of that delivery. Mm -hmm. um, so your question though was how is it received? I think, you know, um, so I cannot claim credit for presenting the results this way. I got this idea from Jeremy Bueller over at um, University of British Columbia. They were really happy there were no radar charts. Um, they mm -hmm. like the bouncing balls. We call this the bouncing balls because um, when you change the filters over here on the right, um, all of this will recalculate and the balls will move up and down. So if, if it's you know, within the gray bar here, that means it's acceptable service. But if it's red, that would be the red you would see on a radar chart. If it was green, that would be the green you see on a radar chart. So these results are limited to our faculty right now and all of our subject librarians. So that gives 
our subject librarians some more richness to the results too because then they can see the results just for the user population and color code it in a way that's meaningful to them. Yeah. So you tried to have any meetings, Sarah, with uh, those, the subject librarians, the group, to discuss how they are interpreting these data? Um, it might be we've had a faculty meeting, and mm -hmm. we've presented this at the departmental meeting for our research and education department. Yep. So, so you've had some. some and um, uh, Rachel, are, are you thinking? How how are you thinking in terms of how this information can be used uh, by the subject uh, liaison librarians at your institution? You may have muted yourself. How about now? Is that yes. better? Oh, <laughs> this <thing>. is better. <laughs> now we get a voice. We haven't mapped um, the sort of individual information back to a department level in the same way that Sarah has. So we are looking at our results at the school and college level according to the LibQual categories and putting together sort of um, versions or reports of the ability to look at that data by those broad areas. So sometimes that might be uh, pertinent to one or two selectors or subject liaisons, and sometimes in the humanities there might be more people that would be um, connected to those departments. So we're not looking at looking at them at this point with that level of specificity. But mm -hmm. the nice thing about maintaining the email address with the data is that we have the ability to do that easily because that's part of our ILS data and all of the other patron data that we have and you know have that ability to look at it together. Yeah. And actually one of the participants, Ariel, Deerdorf was asking uh, specifically, you know, about how you are planning uh, on matching the respondents to other data based on their name, email, uh, what kinds of data are you hoping to compare it to? It sounds that at this point y you don't have a specific plan, but the ability is there if the need to do that comes in the future. Yes, and I expect as we look more closely at certain pieces, there will be questions that are raised that then we'll be able to answer as a result to say, oh, well, you know, what does this mean? And then we can look more closely. But we don't have a particular question in mind at this point. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Brian Roberts from Brigham Young University. He says, at Brigham Young University, we opted to use Qualtrics to administer our survey and thus maintain anonymity as well as allowed us to personalize the surveys and track those that had gone to the live call survey though we had no idea if they ever completed it. Uh, it did improve our response rate somewhat from our 2013 effort and certainly minimized the number of reminders that were sent. Um, so, Rachel, do you want to say something about the, the reminders and the burden on the respondents? I know that was a big driving force. Sure, we were really pleased at the, po at the potential to not send reminders to people who had already responded and to not have to craft the explanation. If you've already received, you know, if you've already responded, then you can ignore this or um, the explanation again that we don't know whether or not that you've responded. It just seemed um, inelegant and um, we felt like we would be losing people and burning, um, burning capital that, at that point. So we were really pleased to have that. And then it cut down on people sending messages saying, oh, I already returned my survey, you know, or introducing confusion about whether or not we had received their survey. So we were really glad to be able to do that. It's hard for us to know sort of what the impact was. It turns out that we sent fewer reminders. So in the past, we would sometimes send the surveys coming, here's your survey, and then send three reminders depending on the user group. We stopped after two reminders. And it, we may have just that may have just been a result of our our experience, knowing that they were people who were not responding and being able to follow that and then seeing the numbers that we were getting back, we felt okay 
and we said, you know, we don't need to send another reminder. So in some ways, just having more information about what was happening allowed us to make a choice not to send another reminder, um, which I don't think we were anticipating at all. Yeah. And in closing, this is going to be my last question. I know both of you work very closely with your institutional research um, offices on your campus. Uh, would you like to say a word about how that relation is helping, enhancing, you know, the implementation of LibCall? Because it, that good relationship, I think, is important to be able to do a confidential version of the survey. Sarah, do you want to step into? Um, well, sure. Um, I have a pretty good relationship with our institutional research office over the years after sending many, many requests to them, they said, well, how about we just give you access to this data? <laughs> so, um, so for instance, I used to have to ask our institutional research office for lists of names for various surveys. And so um, they coached me through what I needed to do here on campus to take uh, the appropriate training and get the appropriate certifications so that I could start mining some of that data on my own. Um, I can't do all of it. For instance, uh, faculty data I still have to request from our HR department, but I can generate my own samples for students um, for these surveys. And Rachel? We have a nice relationship with our folks on campus as well, and much of our work really does fall under the programmatic assessment, um, uh, as you explained in your introduction. Since we have uh, access directly to much campus information through our ILS, through the load that's already given to us um, as part of the work that we do, and because there is a lot of programmatic assessment both in the library and on campus in terms of um, how are we serving users and what are we doing and how are we being responsible. So it, it's sort of less in the research arena and more in the uh, assessment end of things. We had been originally had done the full IRB proposal back in 2004, and since then have had an exempt status around our LiveQuell survey. I can say we had always put it forward as confidential rather than anonymous in that, as you mentioned, the IP information was retained and, and you know it was, it was possible for those connections to be made even though all the um, appropriate safeguards were in place so that that wasn't, didn't prevent us from doing the survey. So it really wasn't a big shift in terms of um, changing the parameters. I mean, it certainly it was in terms of our ability to have that information, but it was already information we had connected to a lot of other kinds of library use. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, I do want to uh, to remind everyone that uh, we do have an opportunity to to share our uh, emerging and shifting practices and uh, uh, new ways of engaging with assessment uh, questions and issues uh, at the upcoming Library Assessment Conference, uh, which will take place uh, in Arlington, Virginia at the Crystal Gateway Marriott. So mark uh, these dates on your calendar, October 31 to November 2nd. Um, I hope we will have opportunities to, uh, to do um, a live call share fair there. And uh, at this point, uh, from an ARL perspective, we would like to engage uh, in a few more libraries to sort of do um, the next phase of, uh, of the pilot where uh, we're going to build an online interface and much of the back and forth we did uh, with Rachel and Sara through emails, it is going to be done through a web interface and we would be very interested in having a couple of you um, test this environment before we launch it as a, an integral feature of uh, Live Call for Future Years. Um, so hope to see many of you at the Library Assessment Conference. Hope to see a couple of you into the next uh, pilot. Uh, thank you very much to Rachel Llewellyn and Sarah Murphy, and thank you to Amy Yeager and to all of you who have been with us. Uh, remember, for those who want to listen to any of this information again, it will be available on the ARL YouTube channel. Have a great day. <laughs>